Welcome to the AAAS meeting in Vancouver, British Columbia. As the sun is slowly sinking into the clouds in the west, we have a last interview of the day with Ron Atlas. And Ron has played a, a long time role in a lot of the decision making about when you will decide what kind of data should be released relative to biosecurity and the threat of very sensitive data getting into the wrong hands. So, Ron, recently the events with the H5N1 publications about transmissibility have raised a lot of specters that were associated with early reports, the Fink report that you were involved with, is this deja vu from 2002 from your perspective? It certainly is. We dealt with essentially the same issues right after the anthrax attacks where the public became concerned that the knowledge we generate as scientists could be misused by terrorists and do great harm. The fact that the beneficent research that we do could be misused is a real problem for us. And so the scientific community was behind the efforts to try and develop systems for protecting the knowledge base that we generate. And the Fink Committee recommended the establishment of the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. Um, the American Society for Microbiology gathered publishers and editors and came up with a set of guidelines that the journals have been using to safeguard the knowledge base. Um, it's a very difficult area. It's, it's nebulous. It's, it's not easy to define what is a clear and imminent danger. In the case of the H5N1, the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity decided to recommend against publishing certain amount of data that they thought crossed the line. There are others who disagree, and the World Health Organization has met and uh, apparently said there's more benefit than harm from eventually publishing all of the information. In fact, even back in 2002, we said while there's a line and while we're not going to endanger the public, we're also not going to undermine science because science is critical for developing vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, the real protective measures against naturally occurring and potentially terrorist uses of disease. So we can't shut down the science. We can't advance the science if we don't share knowledge and allow others to test the veracity of our knowledge and whether we can repeat experiments. It's critical that it move on and we're having a little bump in the road as we once again debate the issue of what are the real dangers and how do we always protect public interest. Mm -hmm. In the case of H5N1, a lot of the public media is focusing on the potential hazards if these strains with increased transmissibility could escape into our population. We haven't heard a lot about what the potential benefits are. And that's the other half of, of this whole dual use issue. So, so what do you think the potential benefits are of this research? The potential benefits that are given are that by understanding the molecular basis for viral evolution, we can go out and have a surveillance mechanism where we can detect what's happening in nature and get an early warning that something is going to occur that can result in a pandemic and then we can take the necessary steps to preclude it. Also, how we develop vaccines, how we target therapeutics depends today on our understanding of the molecular biology of the viruses or other pathogen. This research is very important. First of all, it has shown us there is a threat that this avian influenza will jump into humans in a way that then transmits from human to human. We had better take action to protect ourselves against that. We need this research. Um, we're in a moratorium period where we're going to not have some critical research for a few months. That has to be a short period. We have to get back on track. So one of the things about the Fink report it was it's an evaluation post facto. That's the system that we've built within SABB. Wouldn't it make more sense to try to evaluate 
if possible, the research before it's done to make this decision instead of preventing the release of the research after it's done? Actually, that was recognized by the Fink Committee. And the Fink Committee report, if you look at it, says we need to move back the evaluation process as early as we can, that we do, should not be waiting for a publication stage. The NSABB actually was recommended to bring together biosecurity experts, people with intelligence backgrounds who understood the threat of terrorists with members of the life sciences community so that they could enter into the critical dialogue to help advise the community on how to safeguard the research from the earliest stages. Also, hopefully, they would advise us on what needed to be done, what research was really critical. That was set up as a think tank, if you will, of membership. And we tend to emphasize the scientists, but in fact, there are security experts and public representation on that board as well. Well, this is a very complicated issue that we'll be hearing a lot more about over the next few months. It's complicated and it certainly has divided the community. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you, Stan.